Ladies and gentlemen, you are all very exceptional. Of course, you know that. You're exceptional because you believe in the power of free argument to approach the truth, to weed out fallacies. And it's not at all obvious. It's a very particular and narrow tradition which has only barely survived by a threat. And it's a tradition that has been passed on, refined, and ultimately betrayed by an institution called the university. And I will talk about this story in a way you haven't heard before. Uh, most accounts of the university see the university as a creation by the state, where far-sighted state authorities had the idea to invest in higher education, bring about the scientific revolution later on, and the miracle of European wealth. Of course, that's all upside down. First you have wealth, then you have leisure, then you have education, and then you might even have education uh, as we have today. Uh, I have to skip antiquity, even though I'm very fond of the old academy. Time doesn't permit, and unfortunately, there is not that much continuity between uh, the ancient academy and modern university. The history of the university starts in the 12th century. Uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, a culture of Latin literacy had survived, and that's the big accomplishment of the church. Credit where credit is due, uh, but it's not that unusual because other cultures of literacy have always been linked to theology and religion as in Sanskrit and Hebrew and Arabic and so on. What is really exceptional and peculiar about the European situation is that a culture of commercial cities emerged. And for the first time, and probably the last time for a long time, a market demand for literary services for a kind of sophisticated culture of literacy and augmentation emerged. And this market demand came from the intricacies of commerce and contract law. So worldly success began to be linked to be good in the trivium. We hence talk about trivial things, but they are not that trivial. It's logics, it's using language. It's uh, having clear thought and understanding reality and applying it to complex situations and analyzing them. So some scholars emerge, we have accounts from the 12th century that within those cities, educational entrepreneurs appeared. Those were scholars educated in the church, but they had this Latin literacy and they passed it on to students. So groups of students formed around those educational entrepreneurs and those groups were called scholae schools. Uh, and what's surprising is that those scholars, they were highly mobile. They were kind of wandering scholars who moved around the commercial cities of northern Italy, northern France, parts of Spain and uh, throughout Europe. Uh, but they had a hard time making money. Uh, they were craftsmen. They were considered craftsmen in a particular craft, in a particular art, the liberal art, which is called liberal because it's very universal, you're very free in what you can do with it. You can cause a lot of harm, you can do some good with it. Uh, and they had a very precarious situation. Some of those entrepreneurs were highly successful. And it's quite funny how they uh, made a living. They realized that they should start offering accommodation for the students. But it didn't make the money with the accommodation. They made money by selling wine, beer, and liquor to the students. <laughs> so not that much has changed. Uh, so actually, the first universities were kinds of pubs. The first commercially viable universities were kinds of pubs. Uh, but soon, some incentives for residency set in. And uh, at first, coming from the side of the students, the students being upper class, uh, uh, people prone to commerce, being interested in law, studying law, and they banded together as a group of consumers of education, forming a kind of consumer associate to better negotiate with the teachers. Of course, it makes sense. It scales to a certain degree. Um, so they banded together in Bologna. But once you have a group of people who would still like to uh, keep their mobility 
you have a hard time in feudal society, you somehow need a protection. And just being under the city protection would be too much uh, uh, authority over them because they really needed their mobility uh, in order to find the best teachers, in order to negotiate good conditions with those entrepreneurs. So they were playing the game of medieval Europe and that's playing our powers against each other. And of course, to be in the city but have autonomy within the city, you needed a letter by the emperor. So they looked for a letter by the emperor. Of course, they were upper class, well connected, very bright people uh, who got a letter from the emperor and the letter basically said nothing but leave those people alone. That was the first letter instituting a university. Uh, leave those people alone. They are scholars. They mean no harm. Leave them alone. And if you can't leave them alone, just let them go. The right of secession was the main part of this libertas scholastica, the freedom to teach and to learn. And a similar movement, but upside down, a little bit later, happened in Paris. And there it was the teachers that bonded together, the magistri, uh, that formed a group. And that's something very exceptional about the European tradition, that we not only had the city autonomy, we had groups of people having legal autonomy. We had non-state communities, overlapping communities of people who gathered around a certain interest and were able to negotiate a very high degree of autonomy uh, within the competing powers. And that's very exceptional. And that's what universitas means. Universitas means community, and it's in a very legal sense a community. It means that's a community with its own laws, leave it alone, or give it right to secede. That's the main meaning of a medieval community, and that's what universitas means. It's not the building, it's not the institution, it's the autonomy of a group of people. So in Paris it was called Universitas Magistrorum et Scholarium Studii Parisiensis. And the Studii is from Studium Parisiense, that was the institution that was formed, the kind of hub that was formed by this uh, association of people, of autonomous people. Um, and the university is the community of the teachers and the students or the scholars bond together. In Paris, to have uh, autonomy, they went for the Pope. And they got a decree by the Pope, which stated the same, leave those people alone, give them right to secede. Uh, if you can't leave them alone, that was the bulla, uh, the, uh, the patent decreed by uh, the Pope uh, and uh, later on uh, the emperor. And the Bologna students did the same later on. They got another decree by the Pope to play out against the decree of uh, the emperor. So that's how you played in medieval Europe. And for a time, there was quite a lot of autonomy for those groups of scholars and educational entrepreneurs. But of course, a group of producers bending together to better negotiate with the consumers, you know what it's called, it's a cartel. And once you have a cartel, and it's a cartel which has a privilege, because you need the privilege for this autonomy, you start to realize something, that these, those liberal arts are good for a lot of things. Uh, there's a famous saying by Abelard, a famous scholar, uh, who said, well, I tried working with my hands and I figured out I'm no good at that, so I went back to what I'm best at, using my tongue. Uh, but of course, using your tongue, you can spread lies as well, and uh, if the lies are not revealed, it pays out pretty well. So we had quite bad incentives in this uh, collusion between privilege and being a cartel of producers, of course, had an interest in restricting who else could compete with them. Uh, so that's where all this thing of certification, accreditation, and so on starts. Uh, usually, in the French tradition, it was just a kind of high school in the liberal arts. Most students were following the, the lower degrees, and just a few professionals uh, later on would go study law and then medicine, uh, and would usually be employed in the beginning state 
bureaucracies. So that has always been the main demand for academics uh, starting out uh, from these universities. So something interesting changed in the 14th and 15th century. Uh, if you look at popular sayings all around Europe, there's a particular pattern. Before the 14th century, scholarship was regarded in high esteem. A lot of sayings saying like, if you study, you'll have honor, you'll have success, and so on. Starting in the 14th and 15th century, almost all popular sayings about educated people are negative, are derogatory. Uh, there was a very famous popular saying, die Gelehrten, die Verkehrten, which means the educated, they're the crooks. <laughs> Aware. And that, of course, marks all uh, this experience based on bad incentives and privilege that has been conferred and, of course, the increasing statism that is going on. So university wouldn't have survived if there wasn't a new source of energy coming in. Uh, a new kind of culture of literacy emerged within the Protestant countries, in particular in Scotland, in 18th century Scotland. Uh, we have a particular kind of enlightenment, which is very different from the continental French and German enlightenment, where you have wealth due to commerce, where you have a high culture of literacy. It's, uh, it was the first universally literate society, 18th century Scotland, and you have leisure. So entrepreneurs, tobacco merchants, once their ships had set sail, they had plenty of time, they started reading, they started discussing, and around the university, like University of Glasgow, a culture of argumentation and scientific discourse re-emerged. And as in Scotland, it has always been the case that university is a symptom of wealth and the high level of culture, never the cause of it. Okay? And the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, and so on, it all emerged outside the university. It emerged in the workshops of entrepreneurs who had the leisure to be exposed to a culture of literacy and reflection and argumentation. Uh, so they sent their children, the Scottish entrepreneurs, they sent their children to university uh, because they wanted them to attend lectures by the brightest people at the time. Uh, and they funded uh, a lot of university activities and uh, it was really an open exchange and most discussions went on in salons and in uh, smoking lounges and so on. That was the real academic intellectual discourse that was going on and something very similar happened in 19th century Vienna uh, out of which the Austrian school emerged. There's a particular brand of Austrian enlightenment uh, in the 19th century Austria where most was outside of the university. It was in the circles, the Mises guys, the guys guys who met in the cafe house and in the salon culture where entrepreneurs and people from a variety of disciplines came together and the university was a symptom of this culture. Bring those people together. Still, University would have vanished, was it not for another injection of energy? And that's the miracle of the 19th century German university, uh, the Humboldt uh, model. Uh, and I've only recently figured out uh, uh, this success story. Uh, now, Wilhelm Humboldt, uh, which is very interesting, was a homeschooled guy uh, who never had any university degree. Uh, but he tried to convince uh, the authorities of the time that they should consider academics as a form of cultural bureaucrat but bureaucrat in the best sense of the word. And there's a certain Prussian, uh, German, even Austro-Hungarian sense to it that means a figure of a very high ethos. Yeah. And he argued, once you have the best people in those positions, you can leave them absolute freedom. Because it's not so much about what they teach and research, it's about how they do it and how they can be an example for the next generation. So his idea was having the best people and the brightest people you can find, have them stay appointed, but then give them absolute freedom to teach and to research. Uh, his brother was Alexander from Humboldt, the 
most important scientist of his time. Interestingly, also he was completely outside of university, was a private scholar. Um, he was really considered the most important scientist of his time uh, worldwide. Uh, Humboldt's idea caught on and uh, it wasn't only this academic freedom because there wouldn't be enough within the context of the state and the centralization and later on we would very soon see uh, that the incentives were not best. Uh, uh, so it was not such a bright idea. Uh, Humboldt uh, didn't even become Minister of Education. Uh, he uh, resignated before uh, because he figured out he couldn't really uh, control the thing uh, that, that he set in motion here. Uh, but what happened is at the same time we have a climax of German culture. The German people were considered the poets and the thinkers uh, of the time. And by considering the professor, the academic, as the highest example of moral and intellectual ethos, you have a carrot in front of young people and it's telling them you can have it all. You can have income plus prestige, the highest prestige possible, plus freedom to do what you like, research what you like, it's a dream job. For any bright person, that's a dream job. Uh, because usually you, you can have all these things at the same time. So that was very attractive and a lot of bright young people flooded the German universities. Very soon you had an oversupply of academics, uh, which led to quite a few problems later on and might explain a lot about the 20th century. But what do you do with all these young people? Another genius of the German model was to institute the Privatdozent. And they were saying, okay, the brightest young people, they get the right to teach, but they won't get any income. So for a while, all those postdocs and so on, they slave away being attracted because they want to become a professor one day. And because there are so many people, there's a lot of pressure to specialize to specialize and to slave away doing research and you hope that one day you will merit to be a professor. And that worked out really well for a few disciplines. You have a collective, specialized and systematic effort of research. And in very short time, Germany was leading in the natural sciences and philology, and linguistics, Wilhelm Von Humboldt was a linguist uh, himself, and all that, of course, makes sense. Uh, Germany had the best Sanskrit scholars of the whole world. Why? Because, I mean, it's a very tedious task. Uh, you need lots of people spending a lot of time. It wouldn't be economical if you did it on the market and hiring experts. But now you have bright people slaving away 10 years, the best 10 years of their life doing research because they want to have the prestige, the income, and the freedom of the full professor. So that worked out very well. And it was so impressive that uh, all other countries around the world, in France, in the United States, they adopted or tried to adopt this model. Uh, students in France and Italy started to learn German because they had, in order to keep up with the scientific journals, which were mainly in German at the time, so that was really impressive uh, at the time. But one important thing is usually overseen. Uh, you couldn't explain it economically without the particular German situation at the time, which was a decentralized competitive system of tiny principalities who all now started to compete for these professors and everyone wanted to have his little university and that of course improved the incentives a lot for good people to rise to the top because otherwise it'd be clear if you have a centralized system like that the worst would get on the top. Uh, but by having this competition of course you really had a higher level of scholarship in the particular fields that are prone to systematic research. Not philosophy, not economics and that's very interesting that Germany that was renowned for its philosophy lost out in philosophy. It became an era of total anti and unphilosophy at the university. Even in economics, you all know the, uh, the big debate between the uh, historic, uh, historical school and the Austrian school of economics. They claim there are no laws. It's all just research. You'll just look at patterns and numbers and so on because 
that's very easy to delegate to young students and let them do the number crunching research. Uh, it works very well in this model. Now, the competition, of course, it was just the principle of competition. It was not that those princes uh, were so cultivated and intellectual and so on. They considered, and we know we have accounts of that, they considered a university as something like a wine cellar. So if you're a good prince, you have a good wine cellar, and maybe you have a nice university as well, uh, just as conspicuous consumption, one would say, uh, today in economics. Uh, and there are even accounts that, on average, they spend about six times as much on the wine cellar than on the university. But of course, it makes sense. I mean, wine without academics, without academics is chill, still enjoyable, but academics without wine are unbearable. <laughs> Uh, most of the time. So I think it's a rational uh, decision how they did it. But once, of course, this competition vanished, uh, all the incentives, all the bad incentives were in place, uh, got uh, a free run. And uh, when other countries like the, Fran like the French, with a more centralized state early on, adopted this model, of course, it uh, meant something like a Chinese Mandarin system. They had the concours idea, which means, OK, we have 50 jobs in the bureaucracy. Let's make an exam, not for any didactical reasons, not to find out something. Let's make an exam to find out who are the 50 best. And they'll get a job, and the rest, screw them. Uh, so that's the concours system. And I prefer it in a way because it's more honest than what you have today because it's a mix up of the systems. And of course you have like 50 jobs in the bureaucracies, but 5,000 people to get a diploma. That's quite unfair and misleading. Um, and it creates a kind of ferment of an academic proletariat. And that had an immense impact on politics. Uh, most of the tremendous uh, and, and terrible ideological movements of the 20th centuries, you can trace them back to the universities. It's with socialism, it's with nationalism. Nationalism is very easily explained in its ferocious anti-Semitic branch, very easily explained by academics who fear for employment. Uh, because that explains why the Austrian universities, out of all universities, the German national students were more anti-Semitic uh, and, uh, and uh, pro-German nationalists and the German students because, of course, they were afraid that within the Austro-Hungarian monarchy there'll be a lot of jobs for intellectuals to be filled with Hungarian-speaking, Slavic-speaking groups and so on. Uh, so it was just making sure that you get a job as a German uh, academic later on in public service. And uh, if you trace in world history, everywhere the Western model of university without understanding it has been exported. A generation later, you see socialism emerging, you see all these kind of revolutions emerging, and so on. It's a very obvious pattern emerging there. Uh, so one has to ask the question, what's, uh, uh, what's on the balance sheet if you look at, uh, at the university? It's a very paradoxical uh, story. It's a symptom of a very high culture literacy culture of argumentation. But of course, once employed by the dominant motives of the time of statism uh, and bureaucratism and so on, it became a force of destruction. The value of university today still rests in scamming bright young people to come together at a location, meet each other, exchange ideas, but of course, that stops working once the pride is realized that they are scammed and they don't go there anymore. So you're going to have a problem there. There's still some value in going to locations where pride young people get together and form together because they long for this prestige, which is unfairly linked to the institution of the university. They long for this freedom and they long partly also for this tradition of intellectual discourse. The other value, a more important value today, it's a kind of signal for the market because it tells employers that everyone who's graduated from university at least has an IQ about 100 and uh, a little bit above average discipline. So that's already something because it's for free. It's a free signal. Of course, you take it uh, uh, you're a little bit above average. Uh, as long as that's fine, it's a lousy signal. It's very inefficient. It's, 
It's terrible if you look at the economic side, how much money is spent there to get this kind of signal. So the future of the university, of course, will be market provided signals that are more efficient and better, will be market provided education as a leisure activity, which is usually you was in the liberal arts sense. Uh, it's a leisure that you can allow yourself, that helps yourself if you have a high level of wealth in order to maintain it, to pass it on to the next generation. You need to have an interest in a kind of intellectual and moral formation of the next generation. So there's a market demand for that in every wealthy society. It will be a very diverse uh, arrangement and situation. And of course, the third thing, where we can see the future on, of the university is something like the property and freedom society. Because if you remember what, univer what universitas st stood for, it's a group of scholars who cherish and have autonomy. And autonomy means not being afraid to say what you think. That's all it means, autonomy, to have the freedom to speak as you think, plus, Plenty of good wine. <laughs> so cheers. I think that's, that's the future of the university. Thank you very much.